music field, you've got people who really are into the occult and into Satan. Uh, and then you've got some who probably are playing games. But no matter how you cut it, they're propagating Satan. Figures of evil can be found everywhere, in different cultures, in multiple forms of media, and in experiences. No matter what it is, humanity does always try to blame or create something for the evil that occurs in the world. Evil such as natural disasters, war, death, and anything negative that science at the time couldn't explain. Many entities of evil have withstood the test of time and are still widely known to the public. While others have started to wonder out of existence, when someone says, who or what is the root of all evil? Many people think of money or Satan. The people really think of the evil people experience in the darkest times. The Hat Man. Despite often being used in memes, it's the best representation of complete delirium and the worst place the mind can go. The Hat Man often appears on dangerously high doses of Benadryl, dosages that often kill people. Almost as a representation of the damage the users cause to themselves the evil agony they may go through. I think the reason people collectively remember seeing the Hatman during dark times is because shadow figures are very vague. The darkness and lack of familiar human characteristics of the vague form of the Hatman represents a complete disconnection from humanity. The second time I saw the Hatman and his friend, I had smoked a pretty good amount and was awake for nearly four days straight. When you stay up like this after about the 48 or 72 hour mark, you start to get auditory hallucinations, faint music in the background, hearing cars pull in your driveway, etc. Some mild visuals but nothing crazy as long as you're awake and alert. I assume the longer you're awake the worse they get. I finally decide to try to sleep. It's night, probably 11pm. I turn off everything, it's pitch black, besides just a faint moonlight coming through the cracks of my curtains. The instant I turned off everything, what few shadows that cast along my walls and ceiling start transforming into the Hat Man. He starts on the ceilings and moves to the walls, like a 2D being. Once he's in a position to where he's kind of on the wall, but on the ground level, he walks out of the wall. I'm watching this entire time not scared, just kind of fascinated. I was aware of the Hat Man and the effects of staying up for days, so in the back of my head I kind of knew it wasn't real. He was beside my bed, I don't know, five feet away from my head. I'm clearly awake, no sleep paralysis. I find it slightly humorous. I look back and he's still there, and now there's a person beside him, all black too. As far as I could see in the darkness, this being was probably three and a half feet tall and seemed to be wearing a hooded cloak. He stayed right behind the hat man. So last night, I couldn't fall asleep around 11 p.m. even though I was just lying in bed. I get up to make some mac and cheese and decide to take two and one and a half shots and two beers. Got a little buzz going on and ate my food and went to bed. Knocked straight out. Throughout the entirety of the night I kept having a dream of the hat man who was chasing me literally everywhere. It was like a cycle. I'd see him. I'd run into a public space and for some idiotic reason I'd then go to a private area where I'd encounter him and boom. I'd wake up then fall asleep and have the same dream in a different setting. I recently joined, after remembering my experience as a kid. I read a ton of your stories and the similarities astound me, almost frightens me. I can't seem to find one story that accounts seeing multiple hat men. In my experience, I've only witnessed the beings once. As true as the memory is, I can convince myself to believe I was conscious or unconscious due to what I saw. I was five or six. It was around 8am on a weekend and I was getting in before the family. I hopped out my bed on the main floor and headed to the basement stairs to get down there and play some video games of course. I whipped the corner to the top of the stairs facing down and there were four or five solid black sail houses in trench coats and top hats in a semicircle facing me just standing there at the bottom of the stairs. I remember them having no face, no red eyes, no canes and they said nothing. I froze and just stared for about five seconds and blacked out. But it got worse. Guys, I literally woke up at the bottom of the stairs, ran back up into my bed and fell asleep. That's the last memory of that experience. This is what really messes with my head. This is why I don't talk about it and can't convince myself I was unconscious during that experience. 
I'm glad I can finally share this somewhere. Thanks. Shadow figures often represent complete and utter evil in many people's minds. Because shadow figures are not only vague, but also extremely creepy. Even in cases without Benadryl, shadow figures are still commonly seen. Shadow figures are often seen as the epitome of evil. But are they the epitome of chaos? As a Thoth is the god of gods and Lovecrafting literature, he's above all and is kept asleep by lesser outer gods. As a Thoth is also known as the blind idiot god, for when he wakes up from his slumber, the entire universe is set to end. He's a personification of chaos, though whether he's evil or not will be discussed later. Outside the ordered universe is the amorphous blight of nevermost confusion, which blasphemes and bubbles at the center of all infinity. The boundless daemon Sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, and who gnaws hungrily in inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time and space, amidst a muffled, maddening beating of vile drums and thin monotonous whine of outcursed flutes. Despite Azathoth being a threat to the universe, he sort of is the universe himself. The blind idiot god is the reason for all the outer gods and elder gods in Lovecrafting series. He exhibits similar traits to the universe all-powerful, directionless, randomly spawning new life. He may even be a metaphor for the universe, though some think he may be a metaphor for the reader. It is fire and despair, a mass of tentacle or distance that rules with unholy wisdom. And it is beautiful in the way that all untamed, unbound things that know nothing but the deep dark manners of their own nature are beautiful. Lovely in the way that hard truth is lovely, death and destruction made flesh. And there's the crack of bullets as that gets its attention. And when it charges him, Mom throws something at it that makes a flash of blue-white light and a caustic smell of sulfur, and the creature crumples and falls with a scream that goes on forever, and it's like bells. Bells ring in my mind. Around me, I feel the world begin to crumple and fray, and it is sweet, so sweet, I could fall into and drown in the uncoit formlessness that underlies the two misty details of the world that is, if I could only breathe deep and close my eyes. As a thought is not contained by form, or it is not a being in our universe, it lives beyond it. Now the question, is As a thought the embodiment of evil? You may think it's an easy yes, if he's posing a risk to ruthlessly destroy the entire universe, then how is he not evil? But despite being the most dangerous and chaotic evil, he doesn't really have morals, or the ability to be evil. If an asteroid crashes into earth, is that asteroid evil? No. Because asteroids don't try to do wrong, they are simply capable of causing destruction. Though crafting beings can be argued as evil, but they weren't created to embody it, unlike the devil. They're propagating the demonic line, the occultic world, and I think it's a devastating thing on our culture. Satan is one of the most well-known entities in all of history, as it is found in most Western religions. The word Satan itself loosely means the opposer. In the Hebrew translation. This makes sense as Satan is the adversary to God and is commonly seen as his opposite. Satan is seen as a personification of evil and everything wrong in the world and was likely created because of such. One of Satan's earliest indirect appearances was in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve attempted to eat the forbidden fruit by the serpent, who is very likely Satan. In the Bible, it is later found out that Satan is a fallen angel who was punished for rebelling against God. As you can see, Satan, commonly called Lucifer by Christians, embodies everything negative, temptation, rebellion, spite, and the seven sins. In the modern era, many are still afraid of Satan and the effects he may have on our society. The fear of satanic messaging and metal music of the 80s is rooted in fear of the devil. Speaks of, of the culture abandoning its Christian roots. But in May of 1982, Teenagers of a congregation in Topeka, Kansas, destroyed thousands of dollars worth of records and tapes, which they felt contained the message of Satan. The Christian concern sheds light on a more secular aspect of music listening. It's what you don't hear. Government investigation has found subliminal messages on certain albums when played in reverse. A bill now before Congress would require warning labels on those records containing backward masking. When you're afraid of something so much, you'll see in places it doesn't exist, and ignore anything that says otherwise. The devil is the embodiment of evil in Christianity, but who's the embodiment of evil in other religions? I 
Bibles, the rule of the Shaitan, and the Islamic Satan. The Quran, to summarize, says God made all of his angels bow to Adam. Iblis disobeyed God and refused to bow to Adam. He was then promptly kicked out of heaven, where he would eventually be punished to burning in hell. In some versions, Iblis was said to be an angel of high rank before he was cast out of heaven. In a certain fashion, what Iblis did wasn't necessarily a bad thing. He refused to bow down to anything other than God, though he still refused God's demands. Iblis, despite being the ruler of evil, isn't necessarily the embodiment of evil himself. Shaitan, however, are beings of evil. They are invisible to the human eye, while still said to be fiery and ugly creatures. They serve to fool and manipulate people and information, and are generally evil beings. Even the name Lucy translates to devil. The Shaitan are practically the embodiment of evil in the Quran. Apophis, also known as Apep, is an Egyptian deity and is known as the embodiment of chaos. He is a combinant of all that is good, and is Ra's greatest enemy. Apophis is an absolute evil, to the point that multiple heirs of Egyptians perform rituals to protect Ra against the evilness of Apophis. Apep, being the embodiment of evil, is also the embodiment of everything the Egyptians despised and feared at the time. Serpents, natural disasters, darkness, and death. Apophis is often associated with Set as he is also a god of chaos. Both are known for their acts against good, Set, in an ancient Egyptian myth, is said to have killed his own brother, but the goddess Isis began to revive him. In the meanwhile, Horus is said to be born, where he spited the god Set. Ouro, a deity in the Asante mythology, is not only a being of evil, but said to be death itself. It is said that whenever he blinks, someone dies. Unlike other beings, Awu hasn't fallen from good, nor does he exist to maintain the world. He exists to kill humans, and to destroy. When he was created, Awu attempted to kill his own creator. Awu kills without thought, it is only his nature. Awu seems to be an embodiment of absolute evil. Long ago, there was a great famine in the world. A young man, searching for food and straying into a part of the countryside where he had never been before, saw a strange mass lying on the ground. It was the body of a giant, his silky hair stretching from Krachi to Salaga. Awed, the young man wished to withdraw, but the giant asked what he wanted. The young man requested food. The giant, telling him that his name was Owo, or Death, agreed to give him food on condition that the youth would serve him for a while. He gave him wonderful meat that the boy had never tasted before. Pleased with his covenant, the boy served Owo a long time, receiving much meat. Then he grew homesick. When he asked Owo to give him a holiday, the giant agreed, but only if the youth would bring another boy in his place. He returned to his village, persuaded his brother to go with him, and gave him to Owo. In time, the youth got hungry again and longed for the meat that Owo had given him, so he left the village and returned to the giant. He told the giant that he wanted more good meat. Owo told him to enter the house and take as much as he liked, but he would have to work for him again. The youth agreed, entered the house, ate as much as he could, and again worked for the giant. The work continued for a long time, the boy eating his fill every day. But he saw nothing of his brother, and when he asked where his brother was, Owo told him that he had sent him on an errand. When the youth asked the giant for permission to go home, he was told that he must return with him a girl who would become the giant's bride. At his home, he spoke to his sister, and she agreed to marry Owo. With a slave as a maid, they journeyed to the home of the giant. The youth left the two girls and went back to the village. Not long after, he again grew hungry, so he made his way once more into the countryside and found the giant. Owo was not pleased to see the boy, grumbling at being bothered a fourth time. He informed the youth that he could go into the house and get food. The young man entered and gnawed on a bone that he found there, but he soon saw that it was his sister's bone, and now he began to investigate, and he discovered that the meat in the house was that of his sister and her maid. Now he was afraid, and he fled from Owo, hurrying to his home. When he arrived there, he told the people of his experiences. The people went to see the dread thing, but were afraid when they saw the monster. They returned to the village, 
then agreed to go to Salaga, where the giant's hair finished and set it on fire. When the hair was burning well, they returned to watch the giant. Beginning to feel the heat, he tossed and sweated. When the fire reached his head, the giant was dead. The young man saw that medicine had been concealed in the roots of the giant's hair. They sprinkled it on the bones and meat in the house, and the girls and the boy returned to life. The youth proposed to pour some of the medicine on the giant, but no one wanted the giant to return to life. The boy showered it into the eye of the dead giant. The eye opened, and the people fled in terror. It is from that eye that death comes. Every time Owo shuts that eye, a man dies. He is forever blinking and winking. The Leviathan is found over many religions and many stories all across the world. He is usually depicted as a chaotic sea serpent or any monster of the sea. The Leviathan is known to eat the souls of the damned after they have passed. In Christianity, the Leviathan is said to depict the devil and is generally a being of chaos. Chaotic to the point where God ends up having a cast the beast into an abyss just so peace could occur. In Judaism, the Leviathan is more of a Loch Ness monster type being and is not on the same scale as the Christian version, simply threatening man. Though still an incredibly powerful and dangerous being, Dragons and serpent-like beings often used to depict evil, as snakes would scare man throughout history. The Leviathan, like all the former entries, are humanity's way of explaining evil. Evil and wrongdoings are as old as humanity, which explains why man has created so many things to explain evil. People all across history have blamed things for evil, through religion, stories, media, and many other sources, which is why there are so many figures of evil.